This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Excited for the afternoon. My name is Ilan Gore. I run a program called Cyclotron Road. It's essentially an accelerator incubator on steroids for very hard energy technologies and climate solutions. Uh, I say on steroids because we run it out of a nearly billion dollar year research lab called Berkeley Lab, uh, one of the 17 national labs. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about it here. Go to our website, cyclotronroad.org. Check it out for all the students here. Tell your friends uh, we're looking for you all and your friends who are going to create the solution to apply and be part of what we're building. Um, I was asked to give just a, a short kickoff to the climate solution side. And uh, I'm going to start referencing a presentation that a chemist named William Crookes gave in 1898. Crookes was the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science and was addressing about 2,000 thought leaders of the day. Uh, and he jumped in, he said, my chief subject is of interest to the whole world, to every race, to every human being. It is of urgent importance today and a life and death question for generations to come. I mean the question of food supply. When I saw today's program, I immediately thought of this, this presentation by Crooks. <clears throat> Crooks stood at sort of a critical point in humanity's struggle to deal with the defining challenge of that century, which was essentially how do you deal with a growing population and a planet that doesn't have the resources to support that growth? And just as we're starting to come to impacts with, come to grips with the impacts of climate change, they were coming to grips with the impacts of that problem. Crooks went on, he said, many of my statements, and this will resonate with folks in the room thinking about climate, many of my statements you may think are of the alarmist order. Certainly they're depressing but they're founded on stubborn facts. They show that England and all civilized nations stand in deadly peril of not having enough to eat. Our wheat producing soil is totally unequal to the strain put upon it. Now like any good plenary speech, Crooks didn't really bring much new to the table by way of analysis. He was actually building on about 100 years of study and analysis dating back to a guy named Tom Thomas Malthus, who was an Anglican priest an economist who was the first to argue that because population grows geometrically but food production is, grows arithmetically, society is in for a real issue, a real kind of defining moment. And Malthus inspired over the next hundred years hundreds of scientists and practitioners, the likes of Charles Darwin, Annie Besant, John Keynes, from every field of science, zoology, genetics, uh, economics, policy, struggling with these basic questions of how does populations of species grow and wane? What's the underlying science behind nutrition and longevity? How many people can our planet support? And could we, or more importantly, should we take steps to control that growth? In this context, what I'd say to the climate impacts presenters from the morning is thinking about impacts and analysis of impacts is about changing tides. Right? And obviously that doesn't happen with a single bullet. There's no one analysis, there's no one paper that's going to shift how society thinks about an issue. It's a tapestry. But it's important to realize that ultimately the tapestry is built of components. And each of those components is a person who decides, you know what, I'm going to shed light on this issue from a different lens, from a different framing. And all it takes is that one, right, that one last one that breaks the camel's back and gets society to stand up and say, well, we got to do something about this. And it turns out Crooks came about right around that time of the last straw. And his presentation, which is considered one of the most influential at the turn of the century, really crystallized a, a, an internalization of, of this issue. And he ended the first half of his talk, which was about impacts, with something that you'll probably like. He says, the details of the in impending catastrophe no one can predict, but its general direction is obvious enough. 
right? I think a lot of us feel that way. <clears throat> then he actually moved into solutions, right? Just like we are for the second half of today. And it turns out that 100 years of analysis pointed to a pretty simple answer, which is either be comfortable with a world that can only support three to four billion people and is limited essentially by starvation, or find a way for humanity and society to take steps to accelerate what's otherwise a natu nat natural process of replenishing nutri nutrients into soil for agriculture. He says, wheat preeminently demands nitrogen fixed in the form of ammonia or nitric acid. All other necessary constituents exist in the soil, but nitrogen is mainly of atmospheric origin and is rendered fixed by a slow and precarious process. And he goes on and on and on. And the key point here is we got to find nitrogen. There's just not enough. And so he then goes and reviews, and he'd done the analysis of all the different sources of nitrogen. What if we took all of the guano, guano from birds and bats and collected it, which by the way, people did. And what if we looked at the salt flats of Chile? And what if we thought about basically recycling sewage? And the numbers and the arithmetic basically added up to it's not going to be enough. right? And ultimately, the solution that I think everyone had crystallized at the time was there's one source of nitrogen that's big enough, and it's nitrogen in the air. And we got to find a way to pull it out of the air. Right? And if you think at the turn of the century where people didn't really know that much about chemistry and certainly industrial processes were at their infancy, infancy that seemed like a pretty crazy proposition. And in fact, you know, Crookes was skeptical himself. He says, for years past attempts have been made to affect the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen, and some of the processes have met with sufficient partial success to warrant experimentalists in pushing their trials further. But I can say that no process has been brought to the notice of the scientific or commercial community which can be considered successful, either as regard to cost or yield of product. Crookes sat at this turning point, I think, which was a tipping point between skepticism around impacts right, of, of the issue of population growth to skepticism around solutions. And I think for this climate solution presenters in the afternoon, I think you all realize it's all too easy when faced with this idea of, well, how the heck would you pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere? How the heck are we going to do this to just say, why bother? Right? If you're working on solar, the skepticism is around, well, there's no way you could scale enough. And by the way, solar's got intermittency. It's ever going to work. If it's batteries, well, electric vehicles are only one piece of the equation. Where's the power going to come from? If you're trying to fix CO2 out of the atmosphere, people are going to talk to you the same way they talked about to the folks at this time about pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Um, but I think folks in this room realize, you know, why bother is not an option, right? What we need is shots on goal. And Crooks actually took a shot on goal in his work and in this talk where he basically said there's only one way to solve this, which is mimic the process of lightning and do an arc furnace type reaction to crystallize nitric acid. And he went through some of the scaling laws. He, he was dead wrong, right? But it turns out it was barely 10 years later when Fritz Haber, and you all hope, probably hopefully know this story, Fritz Haber, a professor, uh, and Carl Bosch, uh, an early scientist researcher at BASF, started working on a thermochemical process for removing nitrogen from the air. About 10, not even 10 years later, they did their first experiments at about 100 milliliters, right, science. Um, but within 10 years after that, they had actually built the biggest industrial processes in the world. And today, we do over a million tons of nitrogen. We pull over a million tons of nitrogen out of the air to create fertilizers. It's estimated that a third of the population on the planet today would not be alive if it weren't for those processes. We have sufficiently altered the planetary resource landscape such that over 50% of the nitrogen atoms in our bodies at some point went through a Haber-Bosch industrial plant. Right? And so I'd say shots on goal. It matters. That tipping point between solution skepticism and solutions reality can come pretty quickly. Uh, I'd also say Bosch, I looked up, was in his mid-20s when he left his PhD program and started at BASF. He was barely 35 when they did the first work on the Haber-Bosch process. Um, and, and just as the intro to the afternoon, right, I, I run an organization called Cyclotron Road, look it up. Our goal is to find folks who want to take those shots on goal and support them with all the resources we can in doing so in the face of skepticism. Um, I think the reason this event exists 
uh, and commend Sue on, on, and the organizing team, right? The reason UC is here, the administration's here, the climate champions at all the campuses are here, these amazing judges that are sitting here spending half of their day is because I think they have a similar motivation, right? Which is basically, if you're willing to throw your life into this stuff, you've got folks to cheer you on and help you. Thank you.